would like to purchase a copy, I could uh, sell you one, uh, paperback. Um, those are formidable questions. How on earth did we humans, smart as we are, with all of our brains and all of our intelligence and all of our fine qualities, how do we stumble so badly twice? First, into the world of nuclear weapons, which is really one of the greatest threats to the survival of humanity and the survival of life on Earth. And it's a threat of our own making. And uh, this is amazing that we would get ourselves into such a position where we have created the technology with which we can simply reverse four billion years of, of uh, evolution of life on Earth. Well, in partly in justification for that mistake, I think we have blundered a second time into the peaceful atom, thinking that, well, perhaps we can atone for the evil of the atomic bomb by doing something extraordinarily good and one of the things which I think infuses a lot of the true believers in nuclear power is the belief that nuclear power has got to be glorious because the other side of the coin is so terrible. In fact, I believe that what we're seeing here is a massive case of self-deception. And what I would like to do is to show you my reasons for believing this. My background is in science. I graduated with a gold medal in mathematics and physics. Our organization now has nuclear physicists who are working uh, for us, working on our behalf with us. And uh, it, it, it's, if you know the facts, the facts will, I think, make you free. You know, the labyrinth is a Greek myth. Um, Theseus was a great hero. And the, the labyrinth had been created to keep a monster inside and to prevent that monster from ever escaping. But it also prevented anybody from killing the monster. And Theseus, by using a thread, could find his way into the labyrinth, kill the Minotaur, and then find his way back out again. And what I would like to suggest is that the thread that we need to guide us and to allow us to kill these mistaken beliefs that we have uh, become victim to is the thread of truth. We have to really break through the labyrinth of deception, the labyrinth of language, the labyrinth of the technology, the mystification that people feel when confronted with scientific terms that they do not really understand. So let us embark upon this journey. First of all, understanding Fukushima. Uh, I gave this talk in Canada uh, about six months ago and uh, somebody made up this poster in Saskatchewan, I think it's quite a nice poster, and the characters there, I'm told, mean hope. Am I right? Yes. Here is a picture of the four of the six Fukushima nuclear reactors from the outside before the earthquake struck. After the earthquake struck, the picture looked virtually identical. Uh, the damage was not visible caused by the earthquake. It is now believed that there may have been much more damage than previously believed as a result of the earthquake. However, not necessarily. These reactors began exploding some days later. Four reactors exploded quite dramatically. And everybody was stunned. They said, but weren't these reactors shut down? And the answer is yes. They were shut down immediately, correctly, safely, immediately when the earthquake struck. Uh, the, the shutdown systems worked fine. And yet, look at the damage that is done here. This damage was done after the, uh, all of this damage was done after the tsunami hit. Um, and the reason why was because simply because of a lack of electrical power. That's the only real reason for this damage. This damage is not damage from the earthquake. It's not damage from the tsunami. It is self-inflicted damage. It's damage which the nuclear reactors did to themselves. And any nuclear reactor in the world would do the same if it was deprived of electrical power, even if it's safely shut down. 
How do we understand this? Here we have the situation. Reactors 1, 2, and 3, the roofs exploded and the core of the reactors inside melted down at a temperature of about 2800 degrees Celsius. Uh, the fourth one, interestingly enough, the fourth reactor did not have any fuel in its core. It was, in fact, not operating when the reactor, when the uh, tsunami struck. All the fuel had been put into a what's called a spent fuel pool. Nevertheless, it too exploded, and it too gave off a lot of radioactivity. In fact, you can see in this picture a great deal of gases escaping and steam escaping from reactor number four, the very one which was not operating when the tsunami hit. This is the picture of devastation that we see. Once again, devastation caused by the technology itself, not caused by external forces. So the questions arise, and this is a part of the labyrinth of trying to understand what is going on. Why did these reactors overheat when they were shut down? Why did they explode, and how did radioactivity escape? And what is radioactivity? Where does it come from? And why is it harmful? In fact, what is a meltdown? So to penetrate this labyrinth, we need basic facts about nuclear fission and fission products. And I hope you'll bear with me. There's a good deal of information I'll cover in a short time but I only have this one opportunity, so I don't want to waste it. What is nuclear energy, first of all? Well, atoms have a tiny, massive nucleus at the very center, the heart of the atom. And around this nucleus, there is a cloud of electrons. Now, chemical energy, which we're all familiar with, chemical energy is what our bodies do when we digest food, or chemical explosions, chemical poisons, all of the actions, the interactions that we see in the world, for the most part, are chemical interactions, and they involve the electrons, only the electrons, the outer electrons of the atom. They don't involve the nucleus. Nuclear energy comes from that inner nucleus, that inner core. That's why it's called nuclear, because it comes from the nucleus. And it is incredibly more powerful. We don't normally experience this. Uranium, it turns out, is the key element for all nuclear technology, whether military or civilian. There's one element on Earth, only one element on Earth, which is the key to all of this technology, and that is the substance known as uranium. It was discovered about 200 years ago, but had no practical value up until the outbreak of World War II. So, now here's where we have to start unwinding the twists and coils of the labyrinth of, of confusion. There are two different types of nuclear energy, and it's very important to understand this. Uh, now, there's actually three types, but uh, the third type is fusion, nuclear fusion. I'm not going to talk about that because it's not relevant to what we, the discussion of today. The two types that we are, must understand a little bit about is called radioactivity on the one hand and nuclear fission on the other hand. The important difference between these two is that radioactivity is completely unstoppable. There is no method known to science by which radioactivity can be shut off. This is why radioactivity has such a, a, a problem with radioactive waste. If we could turn off the radioactivity, there would be no problem. But no scientific method is known that, that can accelerate, slow down, start, or stop radioactivity. Once, it is, once a radioactive material is created, it simply proceeds to give off radioactive energy on its own as long as it possibly can. Nuclear fission, on the other hand, can be shut off. Nuclear fission refers, not to, uh, nuclear fission refers to the actual deliberate splitting of atoms, like uranium atoms in particular. And these atoms are split by actually firing projectiles at them called neutrons. And the way you stop that reaction is by simply stopping the neutrons. If you can stop the neutrons, you can shut off the nuclear fission process. But you cannot shut off the radioactivity. And this is the problem. When the reactors at Fukushima were shut down, um, 
they stop the fission process. But there has been so much radioactive garbage created in the core of the reactor as a result of the fission, that radioactivity cannot be shut off and it continues to generate a great deal of heat. 7% of full power heat. Now 7% of full power heat is a lot. It's more than enough to melt the core of the reactor. Um, just to give you an example, if you take a 1,000 megawatt electrical reactor, then the heat that would be generated immediately after shutdown would still be 200 megawatts of heat. Uh, I'll do the arithmetic for you if you're interested. It's, uh, there's three times as much heat generated. Uh, I'll just explain briefly. In order to get 1,000 megawatts of electricity, you actually have to produce 3,000 megawatts of heat. Three times as much. Two-thirds of that heat just goes into the environment as waste heat. Only one-third of it gets converted to electricity. And of that 3,000 megawatts, 7% of that is basically 200 megawatts of heat. That's still generated by the radioactivity. Therefore, if the pumps are not working, if there's no electrical supply, the heat is going to be continued to be produced in an unstoppable fashion. The temperature, therefore, is driven higher and higher and higher. When it reaches about 1,000 degrees Celsius, the metal coating on the fuel begins to melt and even catches fire sometimes. And uh, when it melts, it reacts with the steam chemically and produces a lot of gases. And these gases include hydrogen gas. And because of the pressure from these gases that are being produced at 1,000 degrees Celsius, the operators of the nuclear reactor feel that they have to release, they have to open a valve and release the pressure. Otherwise, the pressure alone will blow the core of the reactor to kingdom come. When they release the steam, however, they also release the hydrogen gas and they also release a lot of radioactive material. And that's where the first releases of radioactive material came from at Fukushima. And what's more, the hydrogen gas is an explosive gas, and that's what exploded. It was a chemical explosion which blew the roof off of unit number one and unit number three. There, there's, nobody's quite sure about what happened with unit number two. There may have been a mild nuclear explosion in unit number two inside the core. Uh, but in units one and unit three, and also in unit four, there were hydrogen gas explosions. But once you reach 1,000 uh, degrees Celsius, the temperature keeps going up because the heat is still being added until it reaches 1,800 degrees Celsius. This is the melting point of the fuel itself, which is a ceramic fuel. It's a ceramic which has a very high melting point. This melting point is higher than the melting point of any other material in the reactor, including steel. Steel has a much lower melting point. So unless that temperature can be brought down, it will simply melt its way through the steel and all the other materials in the reactor like butter. So this is the problem. That's what we call a meltdown. Now, uh, they were desperately trying to pump water, to drop water, to funnel water, to douse this reactor with any kind of water they could get their hands on. The only purpose of this is to is to carry away the heat. It's to remove the heat. As, and if you do not remove the heat as rapidly as it is being produced, then the temperature will continue to climb. And so that is basically the fundamental quandary of a nuclear safety exercise. Now, if you just think for a couple of seconds, <laughs> you'll realize that this is a crazy kind of machine to have. Well, who on earth devised a machine which you cannot shut off? Uh, I mean, every machine should have an emergency shutoff switch, right? But a nuclear reactor, you cannot shut it off. So what happens in times of warfare? Uh, what happens if these reactors are bombed? What happens if there's a poison gas attack in a warfare situation? As a matter of fact, there was a report in 1976 uh, from Britain called a Royal Commission on Nuclear Power and the Environment. And the chairman of that report was Sir Brian Flowers, who was a nuclear physicist who had worked both in the bomb program as well as in the peaceful nuclear power program. 
And this report is very interesting. You can get it from the library. There's much interesting material there. He is pro-nuclear. But he said, if nuclear power had been developed in Europe before World War II, then, as a direct result of World War II, large parts of Europe today would be uninhabitable. Because these machines would surely be attacked in the event of war. They would be sabotaged. They would be open to the same depredations that war always brings with it. And you would have wastelands, radioactive wastelands, wherever these reactors are built. So this is really a crazy kind of machine to have in your backyard. And when you look at this beautiful city of Hong Kong, you can easily imagine how this entire wonderful environment could be made uninhabitable by just one bad accident or one bad act of malice. It doesn't even have to be an accident. It could be a terrorist thing. In Canada, uh, we studied in fact, I testified at a Royal Commission of Inquiry in 1977 and 78. Please notice that 1977 and 78, this is already before the very first partial meltdown in a, can in a uh, commercial reactor, which happened in the United States at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. That happened in 1979. Well, this commission that I testified to, they issued a report in 1978 called a race against time. And they said that, first of all, they said that my calculation of probability of a meltdown was more realistic than the industries, and that therefore they believed me rather than them. And they said that uh, using these probabilities, which are more realistic, if we had 100 reactors operating in Canada, then we would expect, under the worst assumptions, we would expect a meltdown once every 40 years not because of any earthquake or tsunami, but simply because of ordinary accidental equipment breakdowns. In other words, this is not even with an external force of nature involved. This is not even with sabotage. This is just ordinary run-of-the-mill accidents. You know, cars break down, refrigerators break down, well, nuclear reactors break down too. And if you have an unfortunate combination of breakdowns, then you could have a catastrophic meltdown just for that reason alone. So, uh, now, let's explain a little more what the reason is for this uh, great heat that has continued to be generated after the reactor shut down. What we see here is a Russian monument to the splitting of the atom. The Russians are great at monuments. And here they have, in the foreground, a gentleman called Kurchatov, and Kurchatov is known as the father of the Soviet atomic bomb. And in the rear, we have a dramatization in stone of the moment when a uranium atom is being split. And you will notice those semicircles on both sides, those semicircles symbolize the enormous energy that is released at this moment, which is about 400 times greater than the energy from any chemical explosion. And you will also notice those two hemispheres. Those two hemispheres are the broken pieces of the uranium atom. Because when the uranium atom is split, it doesn't disappear. It simply breaks into two or three pieces, or sometimes four or five pieces. And those broken pieces are called fission products. And as you can see, the way they are here, they would tend to fall to the ground. And they're called fallout. When you explode an atomic bomb, trillions of these atoms are exploded in a fraction of a second, and the broken pieces of uranium atoms fall to the ground as radioactive fallout. And each time the uranium atom splits, it splits, well, it splits in hundreds of different ways, and as a result, there are hundreds of different fission products, most of which have never existed in nature uh, prior to a man's discovery of nuclear fission. And other, so, for example, I'll tell you the names of some of these things, and you'll recognize some of them. Iodine-131. That's actually a broken piece of a uranium atom. Strontium-90, cesium-137, krypton-85, technetium-99, rubidium, uh, tellurium. It goes on and on and on. On our website, if you investigate our website, which is www.ccnr.org, 
If you go to the website, you will see we have a list of 211 of these fission products obtained from the nuclear industry, and this list is by no means complete. Nobody in the industry actually has a complete list of all the fission products. They don't even know what they all are. And these are man-made, highly unstable atoms. Now, unstable atoms are called radioactive. And what makes them radioactive is the fact that unlike most of the atoms that we experience in our daily life, such as the atoms in this cup, most of which are eternal, these atoms are stable. And that means that even if you go back 100 million years, these same atoms would have been around in a different combination, perhaps in the flesh of a dinosaur or in the trunk of a tree. The same atoms. But a radioactive atom suffers a different fate. It only behaves like a normal atom for a period of time, and then it disintegrates, which happens violently and suddenly. So the atom will sort of last and follow the same biochemical pathways that any other normal atom will, but then at some unpredictable moment, it will suddenly explode, subatomically, and give off a burst of, you might call it shrapnel, uh, uh, something that is thrown off from the atom, and it's that material which is thrown off from the atom which does the damage to both living cells and to non-living materials as well. So uh, that's, that's what makes these substances radioactive. Uh, those are the fission products. And here we see one of the mechanisms by which these fission products were first disseminated into the environment by means of atmospheric tests of nuclear bombs in the United States. Um, it was actually protests by people in the United States, massive protests of, by people about the effect that these radioactive materials were having on their babies and on themselves that brought about the unilateral declaration of a cessation of atmospheric tests by the United States of America, for which they had no agreement from the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, two months after they stopped testing nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, the Soviet Union unilaterally declared that they were also stopped testing in the atmosphere. And two years after that, they signed a treaty, which is called the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty. So the way these things happen is by people standing up for their rights, not by sitting back and waiting for somebody else to do it for you. But it requires some understanding of what the dangers are. Now, don't think of... I think that the use of the word radiation is a, an unfortunate choice. Don't think of radiation, think of radioactivity. Radioactivity is the important thing. Um, the difference is that these lights, I can turn them off. They're giving off a form of radiation called visible light. If I have a heat lamp, I can turn it off. If I have an x-ray machine, I can turn it off. You go to the doctor's office, when the x-ray machine is turned off, it's absolutely harmless. You can't shut off a radioactive material. There's no way of shutting it off. And that's a very important difference. And these radioactive materials, they are actually chemical pollutants. Some of them are heavy metals, but they're radioactive. And so what happens is they follow the same hundreds of different pathways through the environment, through the ecosystem, through the human body. They go to different organs. For example, here we have uh, uh, iodine-131. Iodine-131 tends to go to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is what the body, the body does not know radioactivity. The body just knows chemistry. So when the body gets iodine, it says, oh good, iodine, I know where that goes. That goes in the thyroid gland. If you put, if you put salt on your food this morning, you will have noticed that the salt is called iodized. The reason it's iodized is because they have added ordinary non-radioactive iodine to the salt. And why do they do that? Well, it's actually one of the few examples we have of preventative medicine. The reason for adding the iodine is to, is to protect against the, the formation of a disease called goiter, which can affect the thyroid. And a little bit of iodine in the salt will prevent goiter. Well, the, the radioactive iodine also goes to the thyroid gland, and it also prevents goiter. But because it is radioactive, it disintegrates while it's in the thyroid gland, and damages the thyroid gland, and not only can it cause cancer, thyroid cancer, there are 5,000 children acknowledged to have had their thyroid glands surgically removed in Belarus as a result of the Chernobyl accident from thyroid exposures, 
and I'm sure there are many more than those 5,000 that are acknowledged. Um, but it's not only that. Suppression of the thyroid activity in a young child especially can cause mental retardation, can cause stunted growth, can cause a lot of other uh, uh, bad effects biologically. Now you sometimes hear the nuclear industry saying, oh well, it's nothing to worry about because it's, uh, it's, uh, you get the same thing if you fly in an intercontinental jet. You get radiation from outer space and you get more radiation that way. Well, you know what? When you, when you land at the other end of your journey, you do not have any residues in your body. You do not carry them around inside your body the way you do carry around these radioactive materials. And there is no naturally occurring radioactive material that goes to the thyroid gland and damages the thyroid gland. Such a thing does not exist. In short, the natural background level of iodine-131 is zero. There is no natural background level of iodine-131. There is no natural background level of cesium-137 or almost any of these radioactive materials. There are a few of them which do exist in nature as a result of natural processes, but very, very few. Um, if we look at uh, cesium-137, cesium-137 has a different chemistry. It has a different arrangement of electrons. And the result is it follows different pathways and it goes to the soft tissues because it's related to potassium. It's similar, chemically similar to potassium. It goes to the blood and to the soft tissues and in the case of animals that means the meat. So this is a big problem for uh, agriculture because uh, it concentrates in the meat. So for example, there was a lot of contaminated beef that was sold and eaten by families before it was noticed that they had much too high levels of cesium-137 for anybody's comfort, even the people in the nuclear industry. Not that any level is good, any level is bad, but uh, these levels were quite, quite high. And the reason why they had ended up in the beef is because cesium-137, first of all, falls on the crops and ends up in the fodder which the cows eat, and then, of course, it concentrates in the uh, beef. It concentrates in the, in the tissues because the body thinks this is good stuff. I mean, the whole idea of eating is that food goes in one end, other things come out the other end, but what stays in the body is what the body thinks is good stuff. The body thinks this is good stuff, so it stores it up. Can't blame the body. The body never invented nuclear reactors. We did that. Uh, strontium-90 is another one. Now, you hardly ever hear about strontium-90, and I'll explain why in a moment. Strontium-90 is a bone seeker. It's similar to calcium. And so it goes to where calcium goes, which is the bones, the teeth, and mother's milk. And so when you're nursing your, your infant child, you're actually feeding your infant child strontium, which you have received in your diet. Um, and um, the reason why you don't hear much about strontium is because it's very hard to detect in the environment because it gives off no gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is easy to detect with a Geiger counter. Iodine-131 does give off gamma radiation, and so does cesium-137. So they can detect that, and they can tell by the energy of the gamma radiation which element it is. But with strontium, there is no gamma radiation. It gives off a type of radiation called beta radiation. And beta radiation is very difficult to detect, but once it gets in the body, it's just as harmful. In fact, it may be more harmful than the gamma radiation. Oftentimes, these internal emitters, as they're called, internal emitters because they're really only harmful when they get inside your body. They don't have penetrating radiation. They can't hurt you from outside, but inside your body, they can be very close to the living cells and cause a great deal of damage. And they often turn out to be worse than the external penetrating radiation. Um, here's a, an example of, in the early days, this is in August of 2011, toward the end of August, this is a map uh, showing uh, the radioactive cesium spreading out from Fukushima, and you can see the 20 kilometer radius and the 30 kilometer radius, and there's an 80 kilometer radius, and the colors represent different levels of cesium contamination. And you can see there, those, see those green dots? Those green dots are from 600,000 to 1 million becquerels per square meter. What in the world is a becquerel? A becquerel is a unit of radioactivity and it means one disintegration every second. So when you say 1 million becquerels, you're talking about a million disintegrations 
every second. That would, of course, mean 60 million disintegrations every minute, etc., etc., etc. You can work out how many disintegrations there are in a year. It's, it's a huge number of disintegrations. And that's per every square meter on the surface of the Earth. Every square meter has one million disintegrations per second. Well, though that level is much higher than the Chernobyl permanent evacuation zone. 500, 555,000 becquerels per square meter was the level which, which corresponds to the permanent evacuation zone, where to this day, 25 years later, it's illegal for people to enter this zone. Uh, and yet, people were not evacuated from these areas. And you can easily understand that since we're talking about material, material, this stuff is going to spread through the food chain. So as time goes on, it just spreads out further and further through natural processes of erosion and uh, the food chain. Now, um, why do these uh, horrible things, these fission products, occur in a nuclear reactor? After all, a nuclear reactor is not an atomic bomb. Why should there be? Well, the reason why, of course, is because the energy in a nuclear reactor is also obtained by splitting uranium atoms. And by splitting uranium atoms, you get those same byproducts. The very same things you get from an atomic bomb, you get in a nuclear reactor, except because the nuclear reactor operates for a, a long time, and because it has a lot more uranium, 100 tons typically of uranium in it, you have about a thousand times more uh, fission products in a nuclear reactor uh, than you would have from a Hiroshima atomic bomb. So every nuclear reactor, every year, produces about a thousand times the fallout from one Hiroshima atomic bomb. In fact, Hiroshima atomic bomb did not deliver very much fallout to the ground immediately below because it was exploded in the air to get maximum blast damage. And as a result of that, the vast majority of the fallout went high into the atmosphere, stratosphere, went all over the world and came down in a much more uh, dispersed fashion. But with a nuclear reactor, it comes out at ground level and it's very bad news because it just floats over and it falls out onto the ground. This material uh, sticks to surfaces and buildings upon contact, many of them. Now here is a gentleman, this is an advertisement from the Canadian Nuclear Association. He's holding up what is supposed to be a little uranium fuel pellet, a ceramic pellet. And he says, and the ad is called Small Wonder. Small Wonder. And what he's basically making the point is that this little pellet can produce so much electricity that uh, you would need a carload of coal to get the same amount of energy. And of course that's the great attraction of nuclear power. One of the great attractions of nuclear power is the enormous concentration of energy in a small volume. And so they say, wow, this is great. Look at all the energy we can get. By the way, I forgot to mention in this diagram that nuclear energy really is just another way to boil water. I think most of you probably know that. But what, the, what happens in the reactor core is that the fissioning of the uranium generates so much intense heat that it boils an enormous amount of water. And that water turns to steam, and that steam is used to turn a turbine and generate electricity. Uh, so really, it's just another way to boil water. But what he doesn't tell you, this gentleman here, who's probably an actor, uh, what he doesn't tell you is that that little fuel pellet and these fuel bundles in front of him, that once you use this fuel pellet to generate a little bit of electricity for a short period of time, you can't throw it away. You have to keep it keep your eye on it for the next 10 million years. Because of the buildup of the fission products in that fuel pellet, it has become one of the deadliest objects on Earth. What he doesn't tell you is that if those fuel bundles had just come out of the reactor after being used, he would be dead in a matter of seconds. Because one of those fuel bundles, these are, these are from a Canadian can-do reactor, one of those fuel bundles, when it comes out of the reactor, would kill any human being at a distance of one meter in 20 seconds because of the blast of gamma radiation coming off it. And that's entirely from the fission products. So um, it, it sort of gives you an indication of just how much residual energy there is which is unstoppable and uncontrollable and therefore of little use to the engineers. It just becomes now a problem. 
Um, and here he is, a close-up. He's sort of saying, just swallow this. Just take one a day, and it'll fix all your ills. But unfortunately, this is a poison pill. It's a poison pill. You can't swallow it. And unfortunately, the earth can't swallow it either. And so they have this hitherto unsolved problem of what to do with all this nuclear waste, high-level radioactive nuclear waste. Um, I would like to just add here that the human race has never successfully disposed of anything. And yet the nuclear industry says, oh yes, we can dispose of this waste. What does dispose mean? There isn't even a scientific definition of the word disposal. There's no scientific definition of what you mean by disposal. Uh, in fact, science does not have the ability to even devise a criterion for determining that the waste can be safely disposed of. There's no scientific way of doing this. For this reason, even nuclear scientists have said this is actually a trans-scientific question. It's a question which transcends science. Here's the face of a can-do reactor, uh, the kind of reactor we have in Canada, which China has also purchased. So you have some of these can-do reactors in China also. And uh, unlike most reactors, we have, instead of a single large pressure vessel where the fuel goes, we have hundreds of individual tubes. And the, the fuel goes into those tubes. They're called pressure tubes. Those fuel bundles that I was showing you before, they slide in there. And the advantage is that you can use a robotic fueling machine. You can shove a fresh fuel bundle in one end and take the old fuel bundle out the other end. And you can refuel without shutting the reactor down. So this uh, uh, is a nice, clever feature of the Candy reactor. However, that man standing in front there, the only reason he can stand there is because this reactor has not operated for one single day. Once this reactor starts up, if that man, and then it was shut down for months, let's say, if that man went and stood where he is now, he'd be dead. Because uh, you can't shut off the radioactivity and it's going to be, in fact, that stuff is never going to be handled by human hands again. It'll only be handled by robotic equipment. Here is where they have to put the fuel when it comes out of the reactor. It's called a spent fuel bay. And uh, this is an empty one just under construction. And they have to cool the fuel for at least five to ten years, constantly circulating water through the pool in order to remove the heat, which is called decay heat, from the radioactivity. If they drain that pool or even stop circulating the water, the fuel will overheat and damage itself and will release a lot of radioactive gases and vapors such as you saw at Fukushima. As a matter of fact, that's what happened in unit number four. In unit number four, it was the spent fuel bay that actually malfunctioned. And they, they had leakage from it and there was a lot of radioactivity coming from that spent fuel bay. Do you remember the helicopters that were flying over, dropping water? Do you remember the cannons shooting water? They were trying to put water into that fuel bay to stop the massive amounts of radioactivity coming out of the fuel bay. Unlike the cores of the reactors in units one, two, and three, which at least were still contained inside the inner containment vessel, the fuel bay was completely open to the air. There was nothing but, at, nothing but sky above. And so the, whatever was released from the fuel bay was in fact going directly into the atmosphere. Uh, what makes matters worse is that that fuel bay is actually 100 feet above the ground. It's situated in a very precarious position. This is a cutaway of the Fukushima Daiichi plant. And you can see the, 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 yellow, the kind of gold-colored, grass-colored, that's the primary containment vessel for the core of the reactor. But there's the fuel bay over to the right at the top, and it has no cover really at all. Uh, once the roof is blown off, it's just open to the atmosphere. So, what is a meltdown? Well, it's, very, it's, it's now understood to be quite simple, in fact. The fission products produce decay heat from the radioactivity. The decay heat cannot be shut off, it has to be removed, that means pumps. Loss of cooling after shutdown results in rising temperatures because you cannot remove the heat as rapidly as it's being produced. And at 1800 degrees, the cladding burns and releases hydrogen. There's some dispute over whether it actually burns or not. Uh, uh, many people, including the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, believes that it does actually burn, which means the heat would be much more intense than if it merely reacts chemically 
with the steam. Most people in the nuclear industry deny that it can burn, which is basically denying scientific fact as far as I'm concerned. It's putting your head in the sand and saying, I don't want to know the truth. Don't, don't, don't confuse me with facts. My mind is made up. And at 2800 degrees, the ceramic fuel melts, and once it melts, it's very, very difficult to stop. So the main concepts here are the uses of uranium are twofold, nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors. That's, those are the only real uses of uranium. Radioactive fission products are created in both cases. Bomb fallout multiplied by a thousand is approximately what you get for the reactor waste for only one year's operation of a nuclear reactor. Multiply that by the number of reactors and by the number of years of operation and you realize that we are creating an enormous inventory of terribly toxic materials. Which raises another question. Whoever thought of designing a machine which mass produces poisons which don't exist in nature on a regular basis? What kind of a technology is that? So we have many things about this technology which are really strange. You have a machine which can't be shut down in case of emergency and will melt itself into the ground if you just leave it alone. And you also have a machine which produces some of the most toxic materials, the, the most toxic materials, bar none, that exist on the face of the earth. Um, the decay heat can cause a meltdown. Large areas may remain uninhabitable. And in fact, the Japanese government has already admitted that many of these areas which have been evacuated will not be re-inhabited. And the cost, and, and of course, as you know probably, the exclusion zone around Chernobyl is permanently, permanently unavailable for human habitation. And of course, this also leads to increasing cost overruns in nuclear reactor construction and refurbishment because it becomes harder and harder and harder to try and solve an impossible problem, which is to make an inherently dangerous pro process safe. And unfortunately, you know, human, human, as we saw at Fukushima, human nature is such that you just can never say that you're going to design the perfect machine that will never ever break down. Uh, that's really what the nuclear industry is trying to fool itself and fool you into thinking it can do. And it's a question of, I think, self-deception, even to the point of hallucination. So uh, now, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to speed up here. Understanding radioactivity. Uh, Henri Becquerel, in 1896, was the gentleman who accidentally discovered radioactivity, and it was by studying a sample of uranium ore. Because uranium not only undergoes fission, as I've said, but it also is naturally a radioactive material. And the radioactivity is much more predictable. And you have a, a natural, what is called a natural decay chain, where when a uranium atom disintegrates, explodes, it turns into another substance. And then when that one disintegrates, it turns into another substance. And then when that one disintegrates, it turns into another substance. And so you have a whole chain of radioactive materials of a different kind, not fission products, but so-called decay products from the radioactivity of uranium. Here's Marie Curie. She was the first one, two years after Becquerel, she uh, was a great, brilliant chemist. And what she did was she crushed up this rock and she, ex she took away all the things that were known, including uranium. And she found that yes, the uranium was indeed radioactive, but the residues were much more radioactive than the uranium, about six times more radioactive. And she reasoned that this must mean that there are new materials that have not yet been discovered. She won two Nobel Prizes and discovered two new elements, radium uh, and polonium. Polonium she named after her native country of Poland, and radium she named because of the rays it gave off. These are among the deadliest materials that we know on the face of the earth. When a radioactive atom disintegrates, it gives off either a burst of energy, called a gamma ray, or a particle. And the particle is an electrically charged particle, which is either called an alpha or a beta particle. So there's three types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma, which are the three first letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha and beta being particles, they do not have anything like the penetrating power that gamma radiation has. However, they come to, they come to a stop much more rapidly and therefore have less penetrating power, but they do an enormous amount of damage. Uh, one gentleman, um, Carl Morgan, um, 
he said it's it's like the difference between a bullet going into a china shop and a bull charging into a china shop the bullet has great penetrating power and may smash some dishes but the bull is going to create havoc and uh, generally speaking they find that alpha radiation is 20 times more effective at causing cancer and other diseases per unit of radiation deposited in the tissue than gamma rays so 20 times more effective actually if you look at it per becquerel that is per disintegration it turns out to be more like 200 times more effective in causing these cancers. Um, now the first people who suffered from this historically were these young girls who were called the radium dial painters in the 1920s. They worked with radium paint to paint dials to make them glow in the dark even without any sunshine at all times and uh, they developed a series of increasingly dreadful diseases. First, they developed what's called radium jaw, which meant that their teeth started falling out. They had terrible infections, including anemia. And when the dentist went to work on their teeth, the jaw bones would break because they had become porous as a result of exposure to very minute quantities of radium. Later, a couple of years later, they started developing bone cancers, an epidemic of bone cancer among these very young women, most of them teenagers. And uh, then many years later, about 15 years after that, the people who survived that ordeal um, ended up developing head cancers, cancers of the head. And the reason for this was because radium, it turns out that when radium goes to the bones, it's a similar to calcium, it goes to the bones. But in the bones, not only does it damage the blood-forming organs and therefore cause anemia, which killed Madame Curie as well as her daughter Irene, um, but it also causes bone cancer, but when it disintegrates, it turns into radon gas. And the radon gas which is being created inside the woman's body was carried by the blood up to the head, and that's what caused the head cancers. So, um, pretty nasty stuff. Uh, here's a man who suffered from polonium poisoning. Polonium was the other material that uh, Madame Curie discovered. This is exactly the kind, this is exactly polonium-210, it's precisely the material that Marie Curie discovered. And he died a horrible death as a result of a very tiny amount of polonium-210 being put in his tea. Murder. Uh, from the Soviet Union. He was an ex-KGB agent. And this murder must have come from very high levels because the only people who have ready access to polonium-210 are people working in the nuclear weapons industry. Um, and the Los Alamos National Laboratory which you may know is the place where the first atomic bomb was built and tested down at Los Alamos. They have on their website a description of polonium-210 and they say weight by weight it is about 250 billion times more toxic than hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is the most deadly fast-acting poison chemically known to man. This is about 250 billion times more toxic. What does that mean? Well, in practical terms, it means that an amount of polonium-210 the size of a tiny grain of sugar would be enough to kill a thousand people the way that Alexander Litvinenko was murdered. And what's interesting is that it doesn't give off any gamma radiation. It gives off only alpha radiation. Only alpha radiation. The result is alpha radiation will not even penetrate through a sheet of paper. It won't even penetrate through the walls of a glass vial. So the person who killed Litvinenko, whoever it was, could carry this stuff safely. Until he takes the stopper out, there's no harm. Once that stopper is removed, look out. It's extremely deadly material. So uh, these are, uh, and, and of course the, the third substance that we uh, are familiar with, everybody, is radon gas. Radon gas, and here's something that many people don't realize. You've probably heard of radium, yes? You've probably heard of polonium, maybe. You've certainly heard of radon, right? Well, what many people don't realize is that every single one of these materials started off as a uranium atom. They all started off as uranium atoms. Because these are the natural decay products of uranium. In fact, radium is one of the decay products of uranium, which turns directly into radon. Wherever you see radon gas, it's because there was radon, radium producing it. Uh, that's the only place radon comes from. Uh, and, of course, it killed hundreds of uh, underground miners. So, what we see is that three of the deadliest substances before the first nuclear reactors were ever discovered, before the first nuclear bombs were ever built, 
the three deadliest radioactive materials in the first part of the 20th century were radium, polonium, and radon, and they've killed hundreds of thousands of people, literally. And uh, they're all alpha emitters. They don't, none of them give off penetrating radiation. They're all alpha emitters. Here is a picture of uh, lung tissue. This is lung tissue of an ape uh, who inhaled radioactive material, which is an alpha emitter. In this case, it happens to be a tiny, invisibly small speck of plutonium, which is also an alpha emitter. When the plutonium lodges in the lung, that, that's lung tissue through a microscope, and the camera shutter was left open for 48 hours. So what you see, those spikes on the star there, they're optical illusions. What they are is they are tracks of alpha particles being given off by that small little particle of plutonium. And what happens is, in only 48 hours, this is how many tracks you have. If you waited another 48 hours, you wouldn't be able to see anything because it would just be like an ink blot. Now, you'll notice that only a very small part of the lung is being affected. So why, therefore, is this dangerous? Well, the big danger is that when the cells are damaged, they may be able to reproduce. In most cases, not so. In most cases, they would be either killed or rendered completely unviable. But in some cases, they're able to reproduce. And those are the ones who will develop into lung cancers 20, 30, 40 years later. It turns out that there's a long waiting time. Uh, in the case of people who are exposed to alpha radiation in the lungs, typically it takes 20 years before you see any increase in lung cancer. And then, after that 20 year period, then you see uh, an increase in lung cancer every year thereafter. And the British Columbia Medical Association describes this as a gradually flowering crop of radiation induced cancers. But that 20 year waiting period means that it's very difficult to prove and very difficult to follow up on these people. It's only by very careful work that you can see this connection. Very similar to cigarette smoking. For 40 years, it took 40 years to prove to people that cigarette smoking was actually killing so many people. And uh, the reason why is because when people smoke cigarettes, they don't generally fall over dead immediately afterwards. Uh, you have to really follow them up for many, many years, for their lifetime, to really see what the effect of the cigarette smoking truly is. So there are these four types of atomic radiation. Alpha and beta are primarily internal hazards, whereas gamma and neutron radiation are primarily external hazards, but also internal. When I say external, I don't mean it can't also be internal as well. Um, so the alpha and the beta are the main hazard for civilians, and there's that time delay. This allows the industry to say things like, nobody has been killed by Fukushima. Well, nobody yet. Actually, people have been killed by Fukushima. They just haven't dropped over yet. Because the damage is done now, and that damage will be uh, uh, culminating years hence. Just like those women who worked with the radium, it took five years before the anemia started to develop. It took about seven years for the bone cancers to develop. It took almost 20 years for the head cancers to develop. But they do develop. <clears throat> um, so I, I'm running out of time, and I'd just like to, uh, I think, move ahead. Here's something, this is a document from the Canadian Department of Mines, dated 1931. Um, the world's first uranium mine was actually in Canada, in the Northwest Territories of Canada, way up near Great Bear Lake, close to the Arctic Circle. And the uranium from that mine, originally it was actually a radium mine, because there was no market for uranium before the discovery of nuclear fission. So originally it was a radium mine. It was shut down by the time the war started, it shut down, but then when they realized that uranium could be the basis of a powerful weapon, they reopened the mine, and they used the residues from previous mining operations to produce the uranium for the first atomic bombs. So Canada was involved with Britain and with the United States in the, world, in the first World War II atomic bomb project. And these uh, Indian people living here, uh, there's a man, uh, he's a Dene man. Uh, they lived there for thousands and thousands of years, long before any white people ever came to North America. And he's overlooking these burlap bags which they use to carry this concentrated radioactive material on their backs. And when these bags broke open, they would be covered in yellow powder. And they were not even told to bathe or to shower or to wash off the material. 
nor were they told that these bags were dangerous and they should not take them home, as a good recycling uh, person might do, and reuse the material. They're bringing that radioactive contamination right into their homes, and they were never told any harm would come of it. And the, the traditional story is that, well, you know, back in those days, we didn't know. Well, that's not true, because here's a document from the Canadian Department of Mines dated 1931, entitled Precautions for Workers in the Treatment of Radium Ores. And it says, <clears throat> the ingestion of small amounts of radioactive dust or material in the body, which eventually may have, I'm uh, sorry, over a long period of time, will cause a buildup of radioactive material in the body, which eventually may have serious consequences. Lung cancer, bone necrosis, and rapid anemia are possible diseases due to deposition of radioactive substances in the cell tissue or bone structure of the body. So they knew very well what the dangers were. But this document was written for one purpose only, and that was to warn the scientists in Ottawa who were studying small samples of this material to be very, very careful. It was not to warn the miners or the people who carried tons of this ore on their backs. They were considered unimportant. Uh, the important people were the well-paid scientists who were actually doing the assay work. Um, so um, I'm afraid that uh, I, I wish I had more time, but I would like to mention that the here is a picture. You see that wall there? That wall is uh, 30 meters high. 30 meters high. And if you drive up the side, there's a road at the side, if you drive up the side, you'll see that that wall actually is just the edge of an entire lake that's full of similar material. It's the radioactive waste from a uranium mining operation in Canada. There are 70 million tons of radioactive waste here, and they contain all of the radium, all of the polonium, all of the thorium, all of the, uh, uh, the radon emitting material, it's all there because all they want is the uranium. So what they do is they take away the uranium and they throw away the far more toxic material. 85% of the radioactivity ends up in these wastes. And the lifetime of these wastes is measured in hundreds of thousands of years. So the question is, here's a good question for you when you have an idle moment. How do you safely keep 200 million tons total of radioactive sand out of the environment forever? That's basically what the industry claims to be able to do. So radioactive waste at the front end of the fuel cycle, this is called low-level radioactive waste because you don't get, you don't get penetrating radiation, you, you do get penetrating radiation from it, but not enough to make you sick immediately. So it's called low-level radiation, but it's the alpha radiation, which is the deadliest stuff, which is in there. Well, um, I think I will just conclude by saying, because my time is indeed up, First of all, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity of coming here. Uh, I'd like to make two final points. The first is that as if this wasn't enough of a problem, what I've shown you here, there is still another problem which is in a sense even more serious and the one that first got me involved in this issue. And that is that every nuclear reactor produces a man-made substance called plutonium. Plutonium does not exist in nature at all and it is the main nuclear explosive material in the nuclear arsenals of the world. If you go to find plutonium on planet Earth, the only place you can find it is where we have made it. It doesn't exist in nature. Every time we build a nuclear reactor anywhere, we are creating a repository of plutonium, which can be used at any time in the future to make atomic bombs by whoever wants to do so. That plutonium has a 24,000 year half-life which means that in 24,000 years it will have diminished in quantity by only one half as a result of radioactive disintegration. Uh, so it means that for tens of thousands of years this remains, we are literally planting the seeds of our own destruction by building these reactors around the world. This is a very, very serious problem. And whereas it's easy to say that, well, you know, the big superpowers like China and the United States and Russia, they're going to look after it. Uh, yeah, but they want to build these reactors everywhere. They want to build these reactors. They want to sell them everywhere. So we are really saying, what happens when you have a world in which everybody has access to these nuclear weapons materials, including criminals who hijack the shipments, and terrorist groups who just buy it, or get uh, inside com 
inside people to uh, give them some out of sympathy for their cause. So uh, this is a, a terrible uh, projection. Final point, however, is this, is that we are an enormously resourceful species. And there's nothing more powerful than the, the power of an idea whose time has come. And this is the time when we really must put an end to this foolishness and this insanity. So I, I think that we have to really change the priorities of our lives and say this cannot be just a matter of tabletop. This has to be a matter of commitment and action on the part of every one of us. And it doesn't have to be strident. It doesn't have to be accusatory. Because in fact, this is an enormous blunder which affects every single person on the planet. Therefore, we're all affected by it, and what we have to do is reach out to people with what they are most concerned about and say, you know, that's going to be destroyed. People in Hong Kong, for example, do they know that their insurance policies give them no protection in the event of a nuclear accident? That there is a special clause written into every insurance policy saying you have no protection at all in the case of a nuclear accident. Your investment is gone with the wind. Now, why is nuclear the only technology on Earth which requires such a clause to be in the insurance policy? Also, in Canada at least, I, I, I should have found out about uh, China, but in Canada and the United States and many other countries, there are special laws in place to limit the legal liability of the owners of nuclear power reactors against any liability beyond a certain minimal amount in the event of a nuclear accident. and. The same law gives a complete exemption to all the manufacturers of nuclear equipment. They cannot be sued or held liable if an accident happens, even if their faulty or defective equipment caused the accident. So when, when people tell you from the industry side or the government side, oh, you're being, you're being a scaremonger, you're, being, uh, you're trying to just scare people, you're not being realistic, they think it's realistic, they take precautions to protect themselves. Uh, so you just throw it back in their face and say, listen, this is a serious matter. They wouldn't be passing these laws or putting these clauses in the insurance policy if they didn't believe that this was a real threat. So we have to reach out to everybody. You can't just assume that because a certain person has a certain orientation or a certain attitude towards things, that therefore he's unreachable. They're all reachable. We are all reachable, and we have to realize that we're all in the same boat. Thank you very much.